encourage you to ask questions during the lecture, but please do so in the chat. Um, and uh, I guess one of the organizers will communicate your question to the instructor. And of course, you'll have an, an opportunity to ask questions verbally at the end of the lecture. With that being said, we're very happy to have Eduardo Oregon Reyes telling us about cubulated groups and virtual specialness. Thank Eduardo. you very much, Riley. Uh, well, and I want to thank the organizers for inviting me and for organizing this very nice uh, summer school again. Uh, well, and thank you all of you for hearing me. So as the title says for this mini course, I plan to make a friendly introduction to cumulative groups and to focus on virtual specialness. Uh, some reference about this uh, that I I've read, I mean, this is not the chronological order. This is not the way I learned about cumulative groups, but I think uh, Wise uh, book contains most of what I will say. Uh, also, I recommend, in case you're interested, Hagland Wise, the original paper where uh, uh, virtual special groups were defined. I think most of the groups are transparent. Some notation is complicated and is not really used now, but the proofs are transparent and there are some other tools that uh, are available for curated groups in general. And I also recommend uh, Shepard's notes on Eagle's theorem, uh, essentially because this was the first paper I uh, seriously read uh, for <laughs> curated groups, but this is the first paper when I saw, uh, I mean, how to use the machinery of separability and residual fineness, which in principle is not too easy to digest or it's hard to motivate. And okay, so that being said, if there is any other needed reference, I'll try to say that during the mini course. Uh, and I'll, uh, I think there's a, a space in the website to post all that. So I'll make sure to give you all that information. Okay, so that being said, what is the plan of the mini course? So this is a, a friendly introduction to cumulative groups. So the plan for today is to talk about the basic. Uh, I'll just give you some def relevant definitions in terms of uh, non possibly curve cube complexes, cumulative groups, and also the structure of walls, which is relevant for, I mean, talking about cumulative groups, and also uh, uh, talking about the uh, convex subgroups, which is relevant. I mean, if we have this notion as a category, usually you have a nice class of groups and we need a nice class of subgroups. And tomorrow we'll talk about virtual specialness. And essentially we will talk about uh, the notion of the connection of this with a uh, separability. And in particular with the notion of residual And we'll uh, end the mini course with uh, a review of what we know for cumulated hyperbolic groups. In particular, I'd like to review two theorems. The first one is Eagle's theorem. And also, uh, why is quasi complex hierarchy theorem? And to see some application of this. And if possible, maybe we see something for relatively hyperbolic groups that are cubic. Okay, so this is the plan for these three lectures. So today we'll start with the definitions, but before going into the details, it's good to have an idea of what we'll see. So the question is, what are cubic groups, but not in terms of definition, in, in, in terms of why are these groups interesting? So maybe the first answer that I have in mind is that this is a nice class of cat zero groups. Uh, well, Macarena defined cat zero groups in the first lecture, but there are two ways to understand this. Okay, if you already know cat zero groups, maybe this answer is complicated because cat zero groups are already nice groups. If you don't know, this tells you nothing because we don't know cat zero groups. In any case, why are these groups nice. Uh, well, these groups are nice because they come for free with nice subgroups. Okay. 
which in general is hard to find. I mean, even for, I mean, one and hyperbolic groups, we don't know if they contain surface groups. Uh, so these groups for free come with nice subgroups, which are the wall stabilizers. And moreover, since we, we construct these groups from a cubical structure, we have a notion of dimension, and the dimension of a wall stabilizer is strictly less than the dimension of the original cube complex. So from this, we can uh, uh, do uh, inductive arguments. Which are not easy to do in the general world of cat zero groups. And another reason, of course, is that we need examples of cumulative groups. And the point now is that there are lots and lots of examples. And well, and lots and lots depends, of course, on your flavor of what groups you like. Maybe in your context, there are no cumulative groups. But in general, if you work, in low dimensional topology, or you work with groups of low dimension, usually you get something that is cumulative. So here to the that this is related to low dimensions. Uh, and also, this is the only part in which I'll mention this, but random groups are uh, cumulated for given dimension. So random groups. density less than a six uh, are cumulated. This is a result of beer and ways. Uh, and another reason is that not only that we have a lot of examples of cumulated groups. I mean, we can do interesting things with these groups from the cumulative structure. That means we have interesting tools. And I should say at this point that keep complexes I mean, non positive vehicle complexes are defined as a nice generalization of graphs, and graphs are related to free groups. And usually, why this uh, theory is successful is because we can not to get exactly the same results, but we can emulate a lot of tricks from the world of free groups. So we emulate tricks yeah, from free groups. And this is nice if we believe that we understand free groups. Uh, but also these are, uh, groups are interesting in the sense that even if you have a conjecture and you claim that this conjecture holds for any cat zero group or any nice class of groups, maybe the first place to look at is, okay, what if we impose in addition that the group is cubulated? Well, in, in case of that makes sense. So I should say that cubulated groups also work as test case. Or theorem conjectures, and hopefully, in this case, the question has a positive answer or a negative answer. Well, but this is kind of the flavor of what we'll see during the, the mini course. And how should we start? We should start uh, talking about the uh, combinatorial structure for in which we'll be acting on. So we need to talk about cube complexes. So what is a cube complex? A cube complex is just a polyhedral complex built out of fluid unit length Euclidean cubes. Here cube means of any dimension. And unit length Euclidean means that in principle we have some notion of geometry for these cubes and we want to glue them and we want to glue them accordingly. I mean, like keeping some concordance with the this metrics, so we'll glue isometrically along subcubes. So the way we glue is rigid, but in principle, we have a lot of freedom and we glue the cube in, in any way we want. So a zero cube is just a point, a one cube is a segment, we have a square, a three cube, and so on. And we glue them in any way we want as long as we are consistent with these uh, subcubes. And subcube means or either a face or face of a face and so on. So we glue along interesting subcubes in the boundary of a given cube. Okay, so this is the idea to have in mind. Uh, I mean, I 
through this beforehand because uh, I'm pretty bad drawing cubes. Uh, okay, so we'll leave with that. But we need an extra condition if we want to do some interesting geometry or we want to get interesting consequences for the groups that we care about. And we need a, con a notion of non-positive curvature and we'll write this as MPC. If we ha it happens that uh, the link at each vertex is a flat complex. Okay, so I have to tell you what this is. So you have a vertex in a cube complex, what is the link? So the vertices are exactly the edges that are attached to this vertex. And we, we say that some of these edges are now vertices in the uh, link. They span a uh, simplex if in the cube complex, they span a, a cube. So they span a plus one dimensional cube in X uh, and this cube should intersect. So, Examples here, V and W. So for B, what we have, we have uh, one, two, three, four edges. That means four vertices, and three of them span a three cube, and three of them. Okay, I didn't tell you this gray here means that actually here we have a uh, three cube, and here we have just the boundary of a three cube, but not the, the inside. So this is the link that we should get. And for W, what we get is, okay, we have, again, four edges. And now just two of them form a square, and the other three form a three cube. So this is the link. And what flag means, so a flag complex means that the complex is, first of all, simplicial. And there's a condition that it is uh, spanned by the by its one scalar. So what this means, so in the example here, we have this three vertices, they are pairwise joined by edges, but they just span to simplex. So that means this is not flat. And we can check that the link at W is actually flat. So the, we can say that this W satisfies the non-positive curvature condition, but the uh, So the point of this condition is pretty nice because we can check this condition at each vertex. I mean, assuming that we have finally many vertices to check. Uh, and the moral of this is, or at least for me, the moral is that there is no hyperbolic behavior, sorry, no spherical behavior around each vertex. In the sense that the failure of B of size fain, the flat condition is that this looks like the boundary of a cube, which is, I mean, of a, I mean, just the boundary of a cube, which looks spherical. And okay, as a remark of this is that even being simplicial for the flat complex implies two, two conditions. So link being simplicial. implies that we glue in, I mean, we can't glue cubes in some given ways. For example, this way is not allowed because we don't allow, we don't allow loops. And also that we can't glue two cubes in this way because we just allow one edge for each pair. So all of this is uh, forbidden in the non-possibility curve world. 
uh, okay, and what cat, cat series? So Macarena gave a definition for cat zero groups acting on cat zero spaces, uh, but now I'm just strict to the, I mean, I'll just give it in terms of a, a combinatorial condition. So what will impose for a cube complex to be cat zero is to be non possibly curved, this local condition plus being simply connected. And in our case, this is the same as imposing being contracted. Okay, so why is this MA? If, I, if I'm giving you a combinatorial definition, it's just because this is equivalent to uh, this space having a cat zero metric. So this is the same as X having a cat zero metric or the length distance. Okay, and length here, I mean, I mean, all these cubes have a Euclidean metric. Now you pick any two points in this complex and you take the uh, shortest path. This defines some metric, which is cut zero. And uh, so this is one metric, but there's another metric. So we have the cut zero metric. But we also have the combinatorial metric. On the one scale, which is just, I mean, the usual graph metric in which each edge has length one. And these metrics are different, uh, and both are useful when we are studying uh, cat zero cube complexes and cube related groups in general. Um, but for, for some points, maybe I won't be specific about the metric. If I'm not being specific about which metric I'm using, it means that I give property calls for both uh, metrics, which sometimes uh, that happens. Okay, so this is the definition. Uh, so I mean, non-positive curve means vertices satisfy this flag condition, and this is the point to have in mind. Uh, is there any question at this point? Okay, so this is just the definition, but this definition means nothing unless we have examples. So what are the examples that we can construct? So there's a question in the chat. Okay, so if these metrics are related in any way, so if, uh, well, the um, space is finite dimensional and uniformly locally finite, these metrics are quasi-isometric. So if the cube complex is infinite dimensional, then this matrix won't be quasi isometric. Um, um, but I mean, if we have some notion of finiteness in the cat zero cube complex, then the answer should be yes. Okay, in the case we will be interested, then the answer will be yes. Um, okay, examples. With the machinery that we have, which is just a definition, we can check that the link condition is I mean, the flag condition is automatically satisfied for graphs because the link are zero dimensional. So graphs are non positively curved, and in particular, their universal covers, which are trees, are cat two. Okay, indeed, they are hyperbolic, but in particular, cat two. And another example, which comes from looking at this picture is uh, we have surfaces. So surfaces are homeomorphic to non positively curved uh, square complexes. Okay, and each time I say surface, I mean uh, surface of a uh, genus at least for some. Uh, and you can try to do this same construction for higher genius, or you can just take a covering of this and you get this. And of course, the uh, cumulation here is non-canonical, uh, but it exists. And what else we can say? Ways to construct uh, non possible complexes that are uh, easy to check from the machinery you have. So if we take the direct product of MPC, Keep complexes, we get something that is MPC. So direct product of MPC 
this is is you see you can check i mean what is the meaning of the link of uh, upper now vertices in terms of the link of the original and vertices and also the wedge product i mean along a, a vertex of mpcs and for this we need to check just what happens to the link of the uh, base uh, vertex uh, okay so we have this and in any case uh, when this theory comes interesting, it comes interesting as long as we can construct examples to have in mind that are interesting and are somehow non-trivial, well, unless you work with why angular arting groups are, are next responsibility complex. At least for me, the imagine that I have of, uh, of a non positive curve complex comes from the Salvetti complex. Uh, and for this, we need a finite simplicial graph. And what we do here, we start with a single vertex. And what we'll do uh, to this vertex, we'll glue uh, and tori depending on the combinatorics of these graphs. So what we'll do, we'll glue one loop for each vertex. And we'll continue this way. And what we do, we glue one n cube for each n click of command, which is a complete subgraph on n vertices. And the way we glue is, I should say, is the obvious way. And at the end of the question, we get not cubes, but we get a enter. I mean by this, so we start with our single vertex x naught. So imagine that have just vertices v and w in gamma, they are joined by an edge. So you get at least two loops. And we label this by the same label of the vertices. And when we glue the square corresponding to this edge, we glue this in this way. So we have x naught, x naught, x naught, x naught, v, v. W. And this is the way we glue the cube. And uh, which in this case, we get an, uh, a tutorial, and in general, we get a tori when we glue uh, the cubes. And the reason of the complex why they are interesting because they interpolate between examples that we already know that are cubulated. So in the case, the graph has no edges, we get just a rows. And on the other hand, if we get full graphs, then what we get are uh, tori. So it's all Salvetti complexes interpolate between roses and uh, quarters. And it's an exercise that these complexes are non positive Okay, But in any case, this is a nice family of non positively cure complex. Uh, is there any question at this point? Okay, if not, before starting with groups, we need some extra uh, combinatorial structure from cube complexes. And we need to talk about wall subcomplexes, which is probably the reason of why this theory is interesting when compared with, I mean, when we compare with the general theory of cat zero groups, this is the exact structure that we, that we have. And for this, we need to talk about mid cubes. So if we have a cube in Rn, what we have, we have the uh, transverse hyperplanes, we have n of them. So we have n mid cubes. And for this, Formally, what we do, we set uh, coordinates equal to a half. So in the three cube that we have here, the mid cubes look like this. So we should have 
three of them. Where is the other one uh, here? Okay, and we can do this for each cube. And what we'll do is we have a, a cube complex. So if X is a cube complex, then what we do is we take all the mid cubes for the cubes of this complex. And the point is that these mid cubes have a, a cubical structure. So here the mid cubes have a cube complex structure. which might be disconnected. And what we mean by a wall or a hyperplane is a component of this uh, mid cube complex. Okay, I think for most of the literature, uh, I think hyperplane now is the most used notation, but I learned all of this with the name wall, so I'll keep the name wall. And, uh, and for me, this is convenient because a wall for me is W uh, and H is a subgroup. And I don't know what uh, these people do, I don't care. Uh, well, so let's see in the old example that I knew how to draw of a cube complex. So let's find the hyperplanes here or the walls. So we're here and what we do first, we look at the one dimensional cubes. Mm, beautiful hyperplane. Mm. Okay, I'll take that, thank you. Okay, so what is the mid cube of, a, of an edge? It's just the midpoint. So we have a bunch of cubes here, sorry, uh, mid cubes here. For a square, we have edges, so we have this. Uh, and now we construct the interesting walls. So we have, have another wall here. And this one follows in this way. And the point is that if the cube complex allows you to continue the wall, then you will continue the wall. So this is another wall and Let's see, there should be another one here. So all the orange uh, segments and the square form a single wall. And there should be another one uh, here. And another one here. So if you believe my, I mean, if you believe that I do this correctly and nicely, all the walls are there. Let's see another example. Let's see what happens to this surface. Okay, so there should be a wall here. And if I'm correct, the other walls are here here and here, uh, okay, I'm missing this one and there should be some extra walls and here. Okay, so we have all the walls which are one dimensional because the surface is two dimensional and the point that I mentioned at the beginning that if a complex is n dimensional, then the walls are at most n plus one dimension. Uh, and I define this for any cube complex, but of course we are interested in the case of non-positive curvature and in particular in the cut zero case. Yeah, so there's a, uh, the question is why the orange and green walls are not the same wall the orange and green wall. Um, well, I think, I mean, the point is that we want orange and green were here. And, and the first example, yeah. 
Well, I mean, I want the walls to intersect along subcubes. This is why we care about the cubical structure. And here the intersection is along, I mean, which could be a wall, oh, sorry, a, a mid cube of this new subcube. So we want to keep this consistency of we go along subcubes and subcube is a face or a face of a face. So we don't glue arbitrarily. Well, as a remark, uh, these walls are not subcomplexes of the cube complex. So they have a new structure. I mean, they are of course related to the cube complex, but they are not subcomplexes. Uh, but they are subcomplexes of the uh, cubical barycentric subdivision. Uh, but in any case, that no, that's not needed in general. Uh, okay, let's continue to the Katsir case. So what happens if we have a wall? Then it turns out that the wall has a, a cubic structure that is also Katsir. And indeed how it looks inside this complex, it is two-sided and separating. Meaning that this complement has two components. And actually they look really, really nice in the cat zero case. And well, I told you that walls are not subcomplexes, but there is a moral way to fix this. So what we do, we just take all the cubes intersecting a given wall. And so this will be the cubical neighborhood of the wall. I'll use the notation in W. So this is the union cubes intersecting. W, so in example here, you assume this is a tiling of R2. If this is W, then N W should be this keeps. So in the cat zero case, it turns out that, well, NW is a subcomplex by definition, but moreover, this is a convex subcomplex. And convex here, we mean that uh, uh, any two points in W, if they are joined by a geodesic, then the geodesic lies inside. By the geodesic sigma, then sigma lies inside. Okay, and here you should ask, okay, geodesic with respect to what metric? So I told you about two metrics, the Katsu and the combinatorial metric. And the point is that for the case of subcomplexes, convexity is the same for both. Here, of course, we need to take the modification that if this is a complex, we take this in the combinatorial case, these two are vertices and geodesic is uh, a sequence of paths. Uh, so this is equivalent for case of subcomplex. If we take an arbitrary subspace, then cat zero convexity is not the same as uh, combinatorial convexity. Uh, and if our walls convex, well, in the cat zero case, yes, they are convex. I mean, with respect to the cat zero metric. So this is for both cat zero or combinatorial. Okay, so walls are pretty nice and up to this ambiguity, they are, I mean, we can think of walls are as uh, convex subcomplexes too. And I think this is totally fine. And I think we have enough, enough structure to talk about groups and action, which is, I mean, we, we all like groups, right? Okay, so what is a cumulated group? So we have a group, G we always mean a group, and a group is said to be Q label if it acts nicely on a cat zero cube complex. And what nicely means, it means cubical uh, by isometries uh, on a cat zero cube complex. And we impose this notion of properness and co compactness uh, that uh, Macarena mentioned to make this 
capture groups and cubical, of course, because we want to uh, preserve this combinatorial structure. Uh, in any case, I'd like to say that these conventions are non-standard. I think probably each author has its own convention about what cubulated means in terms of the theorem, the property, and that's been proved. You should, I mean, and this might come, yes, start from having an action on a cube complex without a global fixed point, or maybe with an unbounded orbit. Uh, but in this case, we'll take the probably most restrictive definition. And I think this is fine. We can see enough applications just from this definition, and we still can get enough examples from this definition. Um, okay, so this is the convention that will follow uh, during all these mini course. So each time we talk about cubulation, this will mean the action is proper and co-compact. Uh, okay, and the notation, in case we want to keep track of the cubulation, uh, we'll use a pair notation, so gx is cubulated. We we'll say cubulable if there is a cubulation, if we want to see the cubulation, then this is cubulated. And the examples come from, from this definition, they will come from non possibly cube complexes, which are finite and uh, connected. So if X is MPC, Q complex, which is compact, which is the same as saying finite, connected, we have that its fundamental group acts on its universal coverage, which is cat zero, and this is cubic. Okay, and morally, curated groups are fundamental groups of compact non positive group complex up to a torsion. But uh, in some cases we, we will have torsion, so I don't want to state this as the definition. Okay, so for, for some examples we will have torsion and we can't get rid of the torsion because I mean the group originally has no cubical structure, it has another structure. And, okay, and from this we can just see that free groups are cubulable. And that uh, surface groups. And also uh, from the Salvetti complexes, we see that right angle Arden groups are cubulable. So this is a nice class of Arden groups. And uh, Rose will talk about uh, Arden groups in more generality in next week. So uh, for this mini course, we are all interested in right angle adding groups. So again, we have this finite simplicial graph. And what we do here, the construction, now we picked as generators the vertices of this graph. And we say that two generators commute if they uh, form an edge. of this uh, uh, graph. And as I told you, we can check that this is actually the fundamental group of the Salvetti complex. And it implies that right angle Arden groups are cubulated because they act nicely on the universal cover of the Salvetti complex. Okay, and again in the case of the complexes, so the complexes interpolate between roses and tori. Here, uh, triangle Arden groups interpolate between uh, free groups and free abelian groups. So in the case of the roses, we should get free groups. In the case of full graphs, we should get free abelian groups. And in between we get, I mean, some combination of these two behaviors. Uh, and some moral, which is not true in general, but is a nice way to think sometimes about Brian Gardner, is that if we have a property that holds for free abelian groups, 
sorry, for free groups and for free abelian groups, then this should happen also for right angle R groups. This is not true, but sometimes this is a nice moral to think about of these uh, groups. Uh, okay, so is there any question at this point? Okay, so these are the all examples that we'll see today. Uh, during the next lectures, we have more structure, we have more machinery, and we'll get new examples. So I think it's good if we just see these examples for the moment. But in any case, I'd like to mention properties of key related groups. And so the first property, I think there's a question in the chat. Okay, are there non examples of non cumulative groups? And the answer is yes. And we'll state enough properties to deduce groups that are non cumulative or non cumulative. And so I'll answer uh, that in a moment. So let me first say that the class of cumulative groups is closed under uh, direct products and free products. Just because non positive character is preserved under, under direct product and watch product. So this is under direct product and uh, free product. Okay, as long as we take finally many groups. Uh, and also some properties when we have a cumulative group. So as I told you, this co-compactness assumption is restrictive, but it's nice in the sense that we have nice properties for the cat zero cube, cube complex. So for instance, X is finite dimensional. And also uh, uniformly locally finite. And this is just because this quotient is compact. Uh, and another property of this is related to quasi-symmetry. The quasi-symmetry of the group is the same as uh, the quasi-symmetry type of the space, which is quasi-symmetric 2x, and which is, I mean, something, sometimes this is useful, uh, but this also implies some nice consequences for the walls. So if you have a wall, these walls come with a, a nice subgroup, which is the wall stabilizer. So these are all the elements fixing setwise the wall. This is the wall stabilizer. We can produce these groups for free because we have walls for free. And the point is that we can prove that the action on the wall is still co-compact. So this implies that this pair is also accumulated. And this is the kind of uh, inductive procedure that I told you. So from a cube complex, so from a cumulative group of a given dimension, we have uh, natural subgroups of lower dimension, which is pretty nice. Okay, and some consequences, of course, of having this cat zero structure is that these groups are cat zero. So we have properties for, for free. In case you know, I'll just state a few and you believe in this. If not, we can you can go to Price and Hatfield's book, everything is there. So for example, we have just finally many And you can see classes of uh, finite uh, subgroups. We also have that uh, solvable subgroups are uh, virtually billion. Uh, and also, this is something uh, we saw today that the DEM function is at most quadratic.
Okay, so this is just for free, but we are not using the QLED structure. <coughs> so I think one of ways to understanding QLED groups is also as the opposite of group side uh, having property T. So this is a result of Niblon Roller that QLED groups don't have property T. Okay, and this gives a lot of uh, groups that are not cubulable. Indeed, this uh, for not having property, well, you need an, I think, uh, an action with an unbounded orbit on a cube complex, something like that. We don't need co-compactness. So from this, we have a lot of groups that are not cubulable. And uh, also from Sagi Van Guise, we know something that I mean it's not it's not known for all cat zero groups, but here from Sagi and Weiss, we know that the QLED groups satisfy uh, this alternative. Meaning that or either we have a free group of rank at, at least two, or the group is virtually solvable, and in this case that means being virtually green. And okay, and from this, in case you are not happy with property T, some groups that are known not to be cubulated because essentially they are not Casio groups, mapping class groups are non cubulated. Um, out of n for n of dimension are not cubulated. Um, what else? Well, lattices in higher rank and uh, semi simple groups are non cubulated because of property T, and I'm pretty sure, um, well, hy complex hyperbolic lattices are also non cubulated and they don't have property T, and I think this is a kind of interesting phenomenon, but they are not cubulated. Uh, well, but in any case, this is what we have. So uh, I think we still have some time. So I'd like to finish with the some extra structure that we need and that we'll need for the mini course. I don't think this is, if you see an usual course, uh, I don't know, I mean, an usual way of learning QLA groups, we, you see this at the beginning, but I need to talk about convex subgroups because I want to mention nice subgroups of QLA groups and because uh, wall stabilizers are not enough. So we say a subgroup of a QLA group is convex if there is some y subset of x, which is a convex subcomplex, which is h invariant, and such that the action is also co compact. So, this I will say this is a convex core. So essentially, this is a nice subgroup from the point of view of the combinatorial structure. Um, and if I mean, this is the from the point of view of the uh, universal cover and isometric option. If you like to work with this in terms of fundamental groups and topology, this is something like saying that this quotient, when we send this to the original quotient, this is a local isometry. And that this space is compact. Wait, this is convex in, in what sense? And in any sense, because this is a subcomplex. So, ah, I see. Okay. Yeah. So, this is cat zero or commuter. It, it's true for both. And so, this is the, the nice subgroups that we are interested in and the notation. If we want to keep track of a convex core, is this one. And some remark from this is that convex subgroups are uh, cubulated. We can think of. This. So, um, yeah. So sorry. So for rags, like, do convex subgroups agree with hyperplane stabilizers, or you have more? 
uh, we have much more. I mean, all virtually special groups are virtually, I mean, are virtually convex subgroups of our triangle Arden group by definition. So we get much more subgroups. Okay, what about like a stupider example, like Z plus Z, like R2, do you have anything else that's not... Uh, um... No, we don't have that many. We'll see exactly that example in, okay. in Z2. Yeah. And, okay, before saying that, yeah, I, I want to state that if you have a wall, then walls are convex subgroups because, I mean, the wall stabilizers are convex subgroups because we have as convex core the cubical neighborhood. Uh, okay, and some warning related to the example that you, wanna, you wanted to say is that uh, cubulation depends, I mean, convexity depends on the cubulation. Uh, and the example is okay, you have Z2 acting on the standard tiling of R2, so translations to the right are given by 1, 0, translations up are given by 0, 1. So we can see that 1, 0 preserves uh, this axis. So this implies that uh, this group is convex for this tiling, but for this tiling, the group generated by one one is not. And the reason is that if we take an orbit of any vertex, which would be something like this, and you take the smallest uh, convex subcomplex containing all these points, you should see that it should be everything. So if we call this uh, Z, then the whole Z is all R2, which is non-co-compact for the action, uh, for the diagonal. Uh, but this is bad in the sense that from the point of view, just from the algebraic point of view, this group is not really different to this one. There's an automorphism of and Z2 sending this one to this one. So this is kind of um, a failure of the theory, or maybe this is the reason of why the theorem, the theory is interesting. Okay, the notion of convexity, well, in the cat zero sense, uh, it, is. it is. So, I mean, we have, in the cat zero case, we have uniquely geodesic. So you have two points in a convex, subcomplex, it doesn't matter if these two points are not um, vertices, but they are just part of the cubes of this complex. If the geodesic is inside this subcomplex, then this is convex. For the cat theorem, as for the combinatorial metric, we must restrict to the uh, combinatorial metric. That means we look at the one skeleton of the subcomplex. Uh, but yeah, I mean, convexity depends on geodesic. Okay, so we have this failure or reason of why this theory is interesting. And um, the challenge maybe for understanding this group is to understand the possible convex subgroup. I mean, if we believe that these groups are nice. And so the challenge is to understand possible convex subgroups. groups. And, and this is of course because there are lots and lots of cubulations and usually the cubulations are non-canonical. Okay, so I'd like to spend a few uh, minutes about some examples. So what happens in the hyperbolic case, what means to be convex? So if we say that G is convex, 
this is equivalent to saying that H is quasi convex. We'll talk, I mean, I'll talk more about this in the last mini course about quasi convexity, but it essentially says that uh, this embedding is a quasi isometric. Well, yeah, the embedding is quasi symmetric. Uh, and this is the same that this means, I mean, this is just an, a geometric condition. It's independent on the cubulation. That means that being convex is independent on the cubulation for hyperbolic groups, which is nice, but it's not what happens in general. Uh, in the same reason, groups of hyperbolic behavior are usually well behaved with respect to cubulations. So for example, Morse subgroups are always convex. It doesn't matter if the original group is cubulated or not. <coughs> but also groups of abelian behavior are cubulated in the sense that maximal uh, abelian subgroups are also convex. Okay, and this is a result of a uh, and Woodhouse. Okay, but yeah, so I don't think this process on, of, of characterizing convex subgroups is well understood outside this cubulated group, or uh, I mean the hyperbolic world, or outside uh, this abelian world. So what is in between? Uh, we don't know. Uh, okay, so for next time, so what? Should we do tomorrow? Uh, we'll talk about separability. We'll start not with cubulated groups. We'll start with some different notion. So the separability and residual finiteness, and then we will define special cube complexes. We'll see examples and some properties. So I think that's enough for today. Okay, thank you. I have a question. Um, no, we should stop the recording now. Mm -hmm.